when it is held should be informed by the findings of the uh, Applications Review Committee. And finally, the applica a representative from the Applications Review Committee uh, is to be present at the Municipal Planning Council meeting in order to be able to respond to questions uh, regarding findings and recommendations. Um, on Bill 366, Bill 366 um, is actually complementary, a complementary response to uh, Public Law 33-145, uh, which calls for the development of a uh, Southern Development Master Plan. And poses a land use moratorium for two years following the enactment of the bill or until a master plan is completed, whichever comes first. Next. It will be at, this moratorium will be applicable to the seven southern villages, Santa Rita, Agat, Umatic, Marizzo, Inarohan, Talafofo, and Jotnia. And the moratorium will be placed on uh, the issuance of building permits. However, based on the uh, previous public hearings that we've had, uh, it was suggested that instead of a moratorium on the issuance of building permits, it probably should be a moratorium on any zone changes. Um, also, a moratorium is to be placed on licenses for use of land or buildings, uh, variances, and the creation of pub, uh, plan, you, plan developments. Um, next. Next. There will be, um, there, there, the, the bill recognizes, of course, that uh, one size does not fit all, and that in the event that um, a development uh, needs to be considered and cannot wait for the two years to pass, that then that application can be submitted to the Land Use Commission for review, uh, but will require concurrence from the legislature. Uh, the exemptions, there will be two exemptions to the moratorium. One is the uh, applications that have already been approved can proceed as approved, and uh, there will be no moratorium on the construction of single family homes or minor additions there too. So with that overview, um, we're going to go ahead then and, and um, receive testimony on those two bills. So uh, Mr. Borja, um, if you want to present your testimony. I notice you want to testify also on uh, Bill 366, uh, on just 365 and 366. Correct. Okay, proceed please. What is Mr. Chairman? Mr. Vice I, I, I'm, excuse me, I, I, I do want to recognize the presence of Vice Speaker uh, Benjamin Cruz. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. My name is Mike Borheim, the Director of the Department of Land Management. On, uh, I'll be addressing both Bills 365 and 366 today. On Bill 365, the bill uh, proposes land use action requiring the review and decision of the Guam Land Use Commission that no municipal public hearing be held and conducted until the completion of and submission of all ARC position statements. The Department of Land Management submits no comments on this bill's intent and purpose, but must note that it does not have any control on the attendance of ARC members who represent other departments and autonomous agencies. Furthermore, the language of the bill creates a tone that failure of an ARC member to be present at the Municipal Planning Council will impede further processing of the Land Use Commission. We suggest the restrictiveness of the language be modified, especially the written comments by that agency were clear and unambiguous. And that's my testimony for that bill. On Bill 366, it proposes the two-year moratorium in the development of the uh, in Guam's southern villages or until the Southern Development Master Plan is approved. Again, the Department of Land Management really doesn't have specific comments on the bill's intent and purpose, but must note that the requirement to recreate a Southern Development Master Plan has been in the books since 1988. The only accomplishment on this plan was in April of this year 
with the enactment of another law putting the responsibility of creating the plan under the village mayors of southern Guam. It appears that one of the actions that precipitated this bill is a developer announcing the execution of a Territorial Land Use Commission Notice of Action for a Planned Development District, case number 90-067, in the municipality of Agate. This Notice of Action approving the project was approved in August 8 of 1991. Because this project had remained dormant for all these years, the announcement by a developer created a stir that new action was, was taken by the Land Use Commission. Rather than placing a moratorium on the use of lands by private landowners, as this bill proposes, the bill should instead suggest or implement a sunset provision on notice of actions for land use applications. In this way, the bill places a mandate on the government and not a direct restriction on private landowners who have a right to also determine the best and highest use of their land. A sunset provision would also prevent the type of surprise announcement on a community for an approved activity that was approved 25 years ago, as this case was. That's my testimony, sir. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Borja. Um, I, I'm not going to hold you back further. I know you have uh, another appointment to go to, so um, I, unless you have any questions. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, signing up for uh, Bill 365. Uh, is Mr. Adrian Gogui and Lacia Casil. Uh, Lacia, are you going to be um, speaking? Just Adrian? Okay, so then uh, Mr. Gogui, uh, please. And also you wanted to speak on uh, Bill 366. Um, uh, signing up here is Mr. Travis Kaufman, but I guess he's left already and he was just expressing that he was not in favor of the bill. Um, and Lacia Casil, uh, in favor, and you will submit written testimony, correct? Okay, fine. Mr. Gogui, please proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Nada, Vice Speaker Cruz, and fellow Islanders. I am Adrian Gogui, resident of Orta Chalampagu, and a member of Save Southern Guam Incorporated. Uh, Senators, say Southern Guam Incorporated has provided testimony months prior to Bills 318, for example, and 335. Thus, you're familiar with our positions. We are for responsible development. We are for the voice of the people. We are for government accountability. Uh, we say no to overdevelopment because we want responsible development. And we say no to special interest groups that promote their financial gain. Contrary to the permanent protection of the natural, scenic, and historical resources of the Seashore Preserve. <clears throat> okay, so I've attended uh, the five village hearings uh, this past week and had the opportunity to listen to the villagers and their concerns. And Safe Southern Guam is right there with them sharing the same concerns, sir. We are in favor of 365 and 366 with some recommendations. For example, in 365, we would also like the Municipal Planning Council to be a part of the approval process and not just be a participant in the hearings. Uh, so we're asking if they could incorporate language very similar to Bill 318.33 that was proposed by Senators Frank Huggins Jr. and Senator Tommy Morrison, sir. Okay. Uh, for Bill 366, uh, we're in favor of removing the variance to the moratoria. We believe that that would create a loophole and would put the Guam Land Use Commission and the legislature in the approval process, and that loophole can go contrary to what the Southern Master Plan goal is. So those are some of our recommendations to 365 and 366. We appreciate the legislation uh, that have been put on the table in, in the last few months uh, that deal with land use permitting and the Municipal Planning Council and basically representing the voices of their constituents in the respective village. I appreciate that. And I look forward to participating in this process as we move forward with Bills 365, 366, 
318 if it comes back up again, sir, as well as 335. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gogui. And on your recommendation uh, to incorporate Bill 318 uh, into the bill here, uh, we'll look at that. Uh, however, I think that in the hopes of trying to put more uh, input and say by the municipal, by the municipality itself, Bill 335 was introduced. Um, and but we're gonna we'll, we'll take a look at that and see how how we can find if we can find that sweet spot. Okay. All right. Thank you. Do you have any questions, Vice Speaker? Okay. Um, I don't have any other. Uh, Talina, did you wanna? None. Okay. Um, so there's no other um, witnesses that have signed up for. Bills 365 and 366. We'll now go to Bill 367. <clears throat> 367 is an act to update the International Fire Code and International Building Code as adopted by Public Law 30-199 relative to the means of egress sizing, automatic sprinkler systems, and tiki torches. Signing up uh, to provide testimony uh, is Mr. Alfred Israel. Uh, so, sir, if you want to step forward. Uh, we're, we were expecting also um, a representative from the Guam Building Code Council to uh, be present to provide um, testimony um, on Bill 367, uh, but basically uh, we know that that the uh, Guam Building Code Council has submitted testimony to the effect that they support uh, Bill 367. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Speaker. I'm here, let's see, I'm trying to get my thoughts organized. A uh, little difficult. Uh, Take your time. Okay. The International Code is a uh, private enterprise for profit. It's not, it only becomes law when it's adopted by the legislature or by the government. It's similar to the books being offered in school. You have different books by different authors. And regrettably, it has to be adopted by the governing body of the community. Each community has a different set of building codes. I looked into the building code of Los Angeles and San Francisco completely different from different authors. My nephew is an architect, and that's why I had access to his records. He was one of the architects for the Getty Museum. Secondly, so therefore, those building codes are not written in stone, but can be modified. And this is a request of ours because, for example, we in Guam are very lucky. We have two major industries supporting our island, tourism and military. Most other communities don't even have two, two uh, industries. We're quite lucky, and we're very fortunate. And now we have a chance to add a third industry, and that is a convention industry. Convention interest industry, if we go through with Guam, will bring in this, this much. Every three or four days, one convention, they will bring in and pay and spend $25 million for the three days for their hotel, for their food, and car rentals. That $25 million every, uh, two times every week has a multiplier effect. Uh, the car rental agencies will take their share and spend it again on the island. The hotel does the same thing. 
So there is quite a, and I will not say what the multiplier effect is. I normally would think it'd be twice, but it can be even three or four times. So this is a nice set of business that the island is able to attract because Guam is unique. It's different from the other tried and true methods elsewhere. So we already have lined up quite a few conventions and it's an industry by itself. I, my eyes are dilated. I, I can't see too well. So, we have an opportunity to add a third industry. But unfortunately, there's one item that I wish I request to be added to the bill, and that is a grandfather clause. Right now, there's no grandfather clause. We have, we have here a building permit approval signed by the fire department stating that we can have a capacity of 1,500 people per convention, that the building that we have can accommodate 1,500 people. And it's stamped approved as our building permit. But with the passage or adoption of the latest building code with no grandfather clause, they're only allowing us 640 people in our entire convention center that was built to accommodate 1,500 based on their own calculations in the, in the past. And 640 capacity will not attract the big convention centers that are available in the Orient. Our convention centers is geared, it's an industry by itself, it's geared towards the Orient. We already have booked up people, uh, my memory's lost, I'm trying to think of the organizations that are willing to come. So correct me if I'm wrong or if you remember what it was, what I've said in the past. So therefore, the one other thing I'd like to ask is that there be a grandfather clause. I spoke with the chief commissioner and I asked them, does this code apply to everyone? He said, yes. Does it apply to government buildings? He said, yes. Does it apply to the executive buildings in Adloop? He says, yes. Do they comply with the existing building code? With a twinkle in his eyes, he said, I don't have enough men to inspect the executive buildings. So there will be a problem if we don't have a, a grandfather clause. And again, it might taking the experience of the commercial port, it might involve litigation that will involve costing Guam a lot of money without that clause, the grandfather clause. To avoid future litigation, because one can say, I've got an approval for 1,500 people, and then you, as a fire code, says I can only have 640, that's a big difference. So I'd like to urge the legislative body to add a section about the grandfather clause for those buildings in a, that are already existing. As it is right now, none of the buildings in Guam comply with the new code. And that might create a, a big dissension in the future. A convention center, as I said, will bring in 25 million, every, 25 million every two to three days. So that means two conventions every week, 50,000 a week, 50 million a week, 52 weeks a year. That means an industry that will be valued at $2.6 billion a year. That's a lot of money to be dropped on the island of Guam, plus the multiplier effect. $2.6 billion. That's what the convention center industry is worth on the island, conservatively speaking. So please take in consideration then a grandfather clause so that 
every building in the island can be in compliance once it's been approved. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Israel. Uh, at this time, I'd like to go ahead. Uh, does anybody have any questions of Mr. Israel? Senator, can you leave a copy of that uh, building permit so that we can have it for the record? Uh, is that your only copy? Yes, sir. Uh, but they can make a copy and give this back to me. Huh? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to call Mr. Brent Wees, the chairman for the... Thank you, John. Thank you. I hope you'll be able to stay to listen to the testimony of the chairman for the Guam Building Code Council. Mr. Weiss? I'll call you back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please proceed with your, if you can, go ahead. And um, I, I, you've given um, testimony here. You submitted testimony from the Guam Building Code Council on Bill 367. If you please um, just elaborate on that. Sure. My name is Brent Weesey. I'm chairman of the Building Code Council here at Guam. Uh, the council met a couple times and we to review the proposed bill. Uh, we reviewed it in terms of applicability in, in code, uh, past code, future code additions, and to see uh, what's, what would make it more effective, what's going to be the best value, uh, what's going to be safe uh, or not safe. And so um, I actually spent a lot of time looking at this because uh, the proposal is, and, I, and it's just sections one and two that I'm talking about for the moment. Um, sections one and two uh, propose implementing an upgrade or uh, allowing future code additions to be used instead of a current code addition. Uh, and that would be the 2012 rather than the 2009 code. So every three years, the code goes through this um, evolution and it goes through a lot of review and discussion and then they publish new codes and then jurisdictions adopt them as they wish. Uh, we chose not to adopt the 2012 code because it was so soon after we implemented the 2009 code. And so the council decided we were gonna skip that and we're instead we're looking at the 2015 uh, code series. So um, the proposal was to, uh, in terms of egress, the calculations uh, are different between the 2009 the 2012 and the 2015 codes. And the proposal was to use a future code which allowed um, less width or, or more occupants to egress through. Um, and, and so we looked at that. Um, generally, uh, as a rule of thumb, one does not, uh, one does not support cherry picking or, or picking future sections saying, hey, we want to do this, because codes evolve as a whole component. It's a whole book of codes, and they, and they have to do with egress and, and lighting and, and safety, uh, structure. Um, and, and so it's all kind of one big thing. It's not just a bunch of little things. And so to, to hone in and, and just look at one section and say, hey, we want to do this, can be uh, myoptic. And so we had concerns about that. So what we did was we looked at the 2012 uh, building code and fire code and looked at all the changes between the 2009 2012 and said is there anything else in those changes that would offset the change that we're looking for in just this one specific section and so um, out of that and it was a sizable list um, and and so and it, it had to do with um, service elevators for fire department um, 
I had to do with uh, penetration, pe protection. I mean, there's a whole lot of things, uh, glazing protection, um, stuff that are involved in terms of egress and safety and see if maybe those had impact on this. So the code section that we're talking about, and that's, um, uh, it has to do with calculating the number of, ex of, um, of exit width that you need for your occupants. So if you have 100 occupants and you have a stairway, there's a factor that you use to determine how wide your stairway needs to be to safely egress those 100 occupants. And it's very simple. Um, what happens is um, the code, the 2000. process, they changed the numbers, they allowed an exception, and that was if you sprinkle the building, we'll let you uh, use um, less width to egress that 100 occupants <laughs> than you would uh, if you didn't sprinkle the buildings, because we recognize, the building code recognizes the value of sprinklers, because uh, it, the overall safety is, is increased. And so uh, back in 2000, when they did the 2009 version, they took that out because there was a lot of fire departments were concerned about it was too broad. It was it was allowing too much. Um, it was giving too much away in terms of egress safety, and they were concerned about that. And so uh, it it was there. The exception was there in 2006. It came out in 2009. The code that we're using, and then came back in in 2012. But in 2012, they brought it back with conditions, and that one is uh, not only is the building sprinkled, but the building has to have a voice-actuated egress system. And they recognize the value of a voice system over a uh, alarm system. So, um, well, I don't see it here, but <laughs> you know, you have your pull station there, and then usually you have somewhere on the wall the light, the strobe light, and you have the loud sound, right? And you've all heard fire alarms in buildings, okay? We've become so accustomed to hearing them, uh, a lot of people just sit there and they don't react because they figure it's a test or there's something wrong with the wiring. And usually that is the case. It's not, there is an event and you need to get your butt and get out of the building. So uh, what they realize is that the voice actuated system is actually more effective because when the voice comes over and says, this is not a test, you need to egress safely, you need to go to the nearest exit immediately, people will respond and they leave immediately. So they said there's value to that and so we're gonna bring in this exception back into the code. Um, so that's the difference between the 2009 and the 2012 code and that's the exception that was requested or su uh, suggested in the bill. So we went through and we said, um, we're okay with the idea, but we have some suggestions. One is to allow the 2009 code remain as is, so that if I'm doing a building and I want to design to the 2009 code, I can. But if I want to use this exception from the 2000 future code, whether it's 12 or 15, um, I'd be allowed to do that. So it was more of an option rather than just replacing the existing code. So we wanted to give people options to do that. Um, the other is we wanted to use, we, we encouraged the use of the 2015 code because that's where ultimately we're going as a group and that's where we'll be coming to the legislature in about a year to say this is what we want to do with the 2015 code because we're not really going to, we're just skipping the 2012 code. So that was the second suggestion. The third is a list of three um, Code changes also in the 2012 and 2015. And these are monitoring and, and uh, maintenance issues. And this is uh, emergency lighting equipment, termination of monitoring service and reli reliability. And so your emergency lights, like in the corner there, so if all the lights go out and there's a fire event, those lights should come on so you can egress safely. And so currently, um, you know, you're supposed to maintain them as a general rule of thumb and, and they're supposed to be safe in, in the lifespan of the building. And this is more of a maintenance issue, not a construction issue. 
Um, what the new code requires is that they be tested on an annual basis. There's a log showing that it has been tested and everyone agrees that they pass the test and move forward. So it's just monitoring, so it's a documentation. That's all it requires. Termination of monitoring service. If um, you have a uh, fire alarm system and it requires remote um, sig signaling, so it's, it's to call a third party or to call the fire department directly, um, that if you terminate that system, you need to let the fire department know that you've terminated that system so they, give them ch so they know you don't have an active system working. Reliability has to do with um, um, hardware features, um, uh, systems in, that are implemented as part of egress and all that. And, and again, this goes to um, maintenance. So, you know, often I'll walk into a building that's been approved, it's been inspected, everyone's happy, it's beautiful, and I walk in the door and I pull the door and it's not latching. Well, this is a smoke enclosed structure that's supposed to protect people, you know. That door has to latch. It's an important part of that safety feature and it doesn't latch because they're not keeping up with maintenance. So this is just a section in the code that says uh, this is going to happen. And it gives the fire department more um, strength or ammunition uh, when they're going through their inspections and, and they see these things and say, hey, you're not complying to this code section. So we recommended that these three maintenance code sections be included when if, if you want to uh, allow the exception for the lesser egress component. Um, generally, uh, egress is the, uh, how do you say, is sacred to code officials. Um, generally, you don't want to ever reduce the safety. And, and what this exception does, it, it, it allows option you can do as an option, but if you do as an option, it'll be to the 2015 code and with these three additional code sections. So that's sections one and two that uh, we were talking about. Great. So let me just, uh, if I may, uh, let me just ask um, um, a few questions and then I'll open it up to the panel here. <clears throat> can you please describe the kind of professionals that you have sitting on the building code council. Um, I'm an architect. Um, I'm licensed here at Guam, the CNMI, and California. Um, I've been using the ICC codes since 2004. Yeah, so for a long time, uh, long before Guam started. Um, on the code council is also um, a mechanical engineer, um, a contractor, a realtor, um, the fire department, and DPW. So, so there are professionals that sit on this building code council yes, who yes. are very familiar with the, the building code itself. Yes. Now, let me make sure that my layman's interpretation of all that you've said is correct. Sure. So what we have is in 2009, actually 2010, I think, or 11, we adopted the 2009 code, correct? Yes. And... Um, in that code, the, the formulation requirements for egress capacity uh, for a building uh, was, was very, a lot more stringent. In other words, uh, you probably had to have more stairwells or larger stairwells to be able to evacuate a, a building in the event of a fire a lot quicker. No, it actually... It, it, it had never changed. All that changed was an exception that said if you have sprinklers, we'll allow um, smaller stairways. Okay. Yeah, but, lesser but, width. Okay. Yes. But even then, there may be certain buildings on Guam that do not meet that criteria. Is that correct? Uh, there might be. If, if they were built to the UBC, they would meet the 2009 code. 
if they were, uh, so it's, it's, it's a function of the design uh, capacity of the building and looking at its egress and making sure it has adequate egress. It so let me rephrase with, my question. Yeah. Do we have a situation on Guam where the capacity uh, of that building to accommodate, let's say, 1,200 people um, is not consistent with the capacity to be able to, uh, and the stairwells to be able to evacuate that building, um, that such that then uh, the capa the egress capacity of uh, certain buildings uh, is only sufficient for, uh, you know, let's say 600 people. Sure. And is that the, is that the situation that we I, possibly have? I think that's what we found in a recent uh, project that was built, yes. Right, okay. Now, what we're dealing with here is uh, the safety of people in the event of a fire. Yes, Right. or, or uh, earthquake, a anything that would force people to egress the building quickly right. so and, if, and possibly in panic mode. That's right. So if you have a building that is built to be able to accommodate a thousand people, we want to be able to have the necessary uh, evacuation stairwells to be able to evacuate that many people within a certain amount of time. Yes. Now, um, so if we have some buildings that, uh, that are, although they're designed to be able to accommodate a thousand people, but the egress capacity is not, um, it does not accommodate that, that the new building codes today allows for that smaller uh, capacity provided that it's offset or mitigated by other um, safety, other safety features, features. such as um, the, the activation, the voice, I guess, the, um, the emergency lighting equipment, yes. the actual uh, voice activation that says this is not a test. Yes. Get out now. Um, that maintenance must be kept on the systems and whatnot. And so that kind of you lower that standard, but you have to meet other standards to be able to correct uh, still maintain the level of safety that that we need. Right. Yes, that's the goal. Okay. So maybe given what you've suggested here, the earlier suggestion that we should put language in there that says, I just grandfather everything in. We probably... I in, in this case, if we grandfathered in without exception, the building would not comply. Okay, all right. It was not the new codes that created the problem. The building egress system does not have capacity for the number of occupants proposed in the banquet areas. And so, and so, by grandfathering in earlier constructed buildings, it really does not address would, the situation that we have. You would not resolve this well. issue, no. Okay. Now, in terms of grandfathering, uh, keep in mind, if, if you have an existing building, you built a building 10 years ago, um, this would have no effect because um, you've already built the building and the building was approved and built under the code at the time it was built so the new codes only have impact if you go back and you do major renovation more than 50 percent of the building and then you have to bring the whole building up to code and that's guam law that's not building code issue this is guam law okay yeah all right uh gentlemen any questions none My concern was when you were talking about the different codes, we had the IBC until 2010 when we adopted the international code. And then there's the 2009, there's the 2012, yes. and there's the 2015. Yes. Um, how, whose responsibility is it to know what we're planning on doing, that you guys are planning on going to the 15 eventually? Is it the architect that should know that? Is that the developer that should know that of what's, what's going to happen to make sure that we design our buildings so that when they're finished, sure. they may have been approved and the building permit may have been approved in 2011. Sure. There it wasn't finished until 14 or 15. And we've made 
two different amendments in the in the process and we're not using nine or we decided well we'll keep nine but we'll not have this exception but we really want to move to 15. Yeah. How's anybody supposed to plan a building? It, it's not that difficult, actually. And, and um, there, it's a whole process. It's, it's a rather lengthy and involved process. And what happens is, um, and, and this is what our plan of attack is, the Building Code Council, is we're going to have a seminar with the ICC officials coming to Guam, and they're going to explain to anybody who wants to attend you know, building officials, architects, engineers, landowners, you know, whatever. And to say, this is what the 2009 says, this is what the 2015 says. You're all familiar with the 2009, so we're just going to talk about what changed to the 2015. And so you're all aware of what's changed, what's, what changes there are in the code. So we're going to do that. And then everyone's, so we're bringing up the whole level of education on island with this, these seminars. And it's going to be several days' worth. And we'll touch upon the building code, the fire code, and the residential code. And then after that, we're going to go through a six-month, eighth-month, or however long it takes process as we go through all the changes in the code and say, do we want this? Does this work for Guam? Does this not work for Guam? Or how do we tailor it to, to work for the, whatever we're dealing with here? We have a unique environment. We have special wind requirements, seismic issues. So we want to make sure that um, when we're done, and we come to the legislator saying, we want to approve the 2015 code with these changes. We have already have all the architects involved and the engineers involved, and they all know what the process is. Now, when we come, <coughs> like we did before, is we don't implement it the next day. There will be a three-month or six-month or some sort of process saying, once it's approved, you have this many months to plan for. This is what you have to uh, be approved with. Okay. Now, if you're designing a building and, and you know it's coming, you may want to wait because there may be something in that code you want as part of your building. It, it gives you some more flexibility, like in the case of the stairways, you know, width reduction, like this. Or uh, you may say, you know what, I want to get it under the 2009 code, so I have to get my application in before this becomes effective. So we publish the, the date when it's going to be effective, okay, and then your application date is what governs. So if you apply for your building permit before the effective date, you, we can only apply the 2009 code in terms of review and permitting and occupancy. We don't, you know, your construction may take a year or two, and we're already using the 2015 code, but we're still only applying the 2009 code because that's what you were approved in terms of your application. So it's, there's different ways that we can protect the owner or developer because it it's a lengthy process especially with the bigger buildings you know and, and so how could how could a permit have been granted for a larger number and not be a, um, appropriate for today I do not know I, I you know this building's been under construction for a long time and so I don't I don't know how I mean we're not involved in terms of that something that specific with the project so we don't know uh, one, what the plans were reviewed under what code or whatever. My, my understanding is that a, a um, conditional or a limited permit was provided that yes you can go ahead and occupy and begin to operate provided you keep numbers to a certain number. The fire department went through and did a, a uh, inspection at the end of construction and, and they somehow they were aware that, wait a minute, this doesn't feel right, something's wrong. So they went through and they measured uh, the minimum stairway widths and door widths. And, and from that, they worked backwards and said, you've only provided this much, these many inches or feet and inches for egress. And using the calculations from the code that says, you can only have so many people occupy that space because that's your limiting factor is that egress width. So, um, it's, I've been told things change in design or during construction, and so in that process, um, the egress, the physical actual egress width was reduced, um, but they still kept the main came the same size spaces. Okay, so yeah. there was a change in the in the construction, and it wasn't the. I, 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 that's what I'm plans. told by the fire But department. you mentioned something also. I'm, I'm a little interested in this grandfathering thing. Sure. Is, is, is there any time that it, it's appropriate? Grandfathering. grandfathering in buildings that... 
Well, and, and yeah, if, if you build a building and you don't make any changes, you're golden. The code can change and change and change, but you're still built for that code. And, and, and they can't come back and say, you know, the code changed, you need to upgrade your building. But if you do a remodel, the remodel itself would have to be to the new code or the code that's on being implemented at the time. Okay. Yeah. And um, say it was a hotel that was built 40 years ago. Uh -huh. And it has a large top floor. And they decided to take advantage of this convention thing. Got the whole top floor and turned it into a convention center from the top floor. Um, that doesn't, it isn't 50% of the value of the hotel. Correct. So, oh, you're saying could they apply this if they wanted to? They yeah, what would, what would happen? Would, well, they, would, they, would, would they be grandfathered into the egress um, provisions of 40 years ago? Or would they, with the, with the fact that there's going to be over 1,000 people on the top floor sure. change the egress requirement for the stairway in the entire building, though it was only one, one floor out of sure. 18. Sure. So the egress requirements, if you went back 40 years ago, would not, um, was no lesser than it is now. I mean, th these numbers have been pretty consistent for many, many years, the factors that were being used. It was only recently that they allowed an exception to allow uh, more people in a smaller width. Oh, okay, so, so the recent so, changes have actually been because we believe that the sprinkler systems, yes. the, the lighting systems, yes. the sound, sound activated, voice yes. activated systems would allow us to be able to get people out faster in a, in a, in a smaller stairway. Yes. Whereas in the past, when we didn't have all these, we've always had a much larger stairwell. Yes. And those people are probably, yes. Okay. okay. But, but if, say, you own a hotel that was built 40 years ago, and you say, hey, I want to do convention center on top, you know, um, and, and the bill is approved, okay, um, you can apply this if you want. And, and you can use the, the different uh, factors and have less uh, egress if you meet the requirements of the, that we were suggesting. Just, just one final thing. Um, codes, fire codes, building codes. So for the record, and so that the layman, such as myself, understand and get an appreciation for why we need these codes, what do these codes really do? Um, basically, the codes are to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the, the public. And, and it's to regulate a, a minimum standard for the construction industry and development. And so that... Uh, feeling is anything less than this, you're creating an unsafe situation. And, and you know, um, the Rhode Island the nightclub, there was a fire. And, and, and this is one of those early days of people taking videos. And, and there was a guy taking a video within the nightclub. And it was, the band was playing, and they had kind of fireworks going off, and it caught something on the ceiling. And the guy taking the video actually saw it and immediately started going outside, even though there was no alarm yet, and, and nobody was moving yet, nobody screamed, you know, there was no alarm, and he got out, and he struggled to get out because now everyone's trying to get out at the same time. And what happened was, is that the distance, the egress width was constricted. Uh, one of the exit doors was locked, and they couldn't get out, so now they had to, all had to fit in through this very narrow corridor out to these pair doors and get out. And what happened was, People panic, people trip, people keep going, and people are pushing. And now it was like uh, stacking people like firewood. And, and, and it blocked the whole door. And they're trying to pull people out of the door. And smoke is billowing out. And, and, and people died. And a lot of people died. And so code officials look at that and say, you know what? If we don't do our job, this is what happens. People die. And, and, and so we, we have to maintain at least a minimum standard of safety.
And, and that's all the building code is, a minimum standard. You can exceed it any time. You can provide more egress or want. You can provide more alarms, more smoke detection. You can always go beyond what the code requires, but this is a, just a minimum standard of requirement. And, and it's really just to protect people. Okay. Thank you. No further questions from anyone? Was yes, there any questions please. on the other sections? Uh, well, no. If you, okay. you're going to comment on the other sections, please. Sure. So, um, <coughs> section three and four and five, um, no comment. Section five was something we proposed uh, a little while ago, and that was the Tiki Torch Amendment. And this is something that the fire department came up with, and we worked with them, and we actually worked with um, the local LPG industry consultants and professionals to say, does this work? Can this be done? Is this effective? Do you think this is fair? And we actually, it was, it was a nice collaborative effort and to come up with this criteria so that um, we avoid what happened at the Hilton uh, with the explosion that was a few years back. I don't know if you remember that. So that's, that's the Tiki Torch Amendment. The last one we suggest is adding a section six, and this is the tempered water for public hand washing facilities. We don't have a section six here, but you, uh, the Building Code Council is suggesting to put in a new section six, yes. which does what? Well, um, uh, Guam is unique, again, um, as compared to the states. And so um, most of the, your tap water, as you flow through, it's, it's, not, um, it's not cold. It's, it's temperature is really pretty medium. Um, and so hand washing, and so we went through and found other jurisdictions were also finding no, uh, let's see, no effective use of hot water for just general hand washing. So this doesn't affect um, hospitals or restaurants because they all have their own codes and their own requirements and, and that will be regulated separately. But if you go to just the, the, you're out at the park and you go to wash your hands, by, right now the code requires, and it has for a while, uh, that the water be a certain temperature. And so what we're saying is our temperature is just actually slightly below it and it's kind of a waste of energy uh, waste of effort, waste of money to tr bring it up those extra few degrees when in fact it's not getting us any value. And so in the testimony we actually reference uh, the Mayo Clinic, the CDC um, as to show that this is, we're not preventing, we're not, we're not making it any less healthy, uh, we're just, it's really just the effectiveness of um, not needing additional heating for your, hand, your general hand washing. That's it. Do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the uh, testimony. I, um, I, I just want to get an understanding with the 50% uh, uh, threshold. Um, and, and it's also my understanding that um, there is also a threshold up to 25% um, that requires no uh, building permit. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah, yes, that's correct. Okay. What's your thoughts on that? Is 50% the standard? Well, the previous DPW director asked us to look at it and then resigned, so we never got to it. Um, he was hoping at some point we would look at this as an issue, and I, and I think we will. We're, we were busy with the energy code at the time also. Um, the concern is, is that there are certain things that do need to be permitted, um, and, and the dollar figure really isn't that important. So uh, anything that has to do with egress, um, a lot of electrical work, you know, if you're, if you're doing just, and in the building permits a, is not a, a lengthy process, it's, the inspection is not a difficult process. If it's a small, it's electrical, they come out and inspect, yeah, you're good, and go on. But these are things that uh, when they go wrong, they go very wrong and, and cause problems. So um, a small dollar, the 25% is, is not a very low threshold for little projects. And 25% and for a big building is a lot of money. And so no permit is, is a concern. And I know uh, DPW has, has an issue with this, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Great, thank you very much. And Mr. Weiss, I just wanna say that I, um, um, I'm, I'm certainly appreciative of the work that the Building Code Council does. Uh, and I will state for the record that I do have a lot of confidence in the building code council and the members that serve on it. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, 
the council is being funded um, and and that it continues its work in keeping our codes uh, current. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there being no further uh, questions or testimony on Bill 367, uh, we'll consider then Bill 367 as having been duly heard. Um, and we will then call this hearing Um, and there being no further testimonies, I'm going to put this hearing into recess and we will reconvene for the final hearing in Umatic at the Community Center on Thursday, September 29th, uh, 2016 at 6.30 p.m. It is now uh, 2 p.m. Thank you.